All right, let's go. So uh, I'll start recording on the Zoom side. Nance, you can record on the OBS side. So we have a backup. Three, two, one. Recording in progress. All right, welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker. And today we have a co-host, Nance is in the house and we are joined by Daniel Tutt, a returning guest of the channel and someone who we were just collaborating with both on tour and in the Underground Theory volume. Welcome back. How are you doing, Daniel? I'm doing great, guys. Nice to be back. Nice to be back. Things are good. I mean, yeah, things are good. I'm uh, excited for this convo, which like all of our convos have this strange like social media crisis. I post something, <laughs> people get outraged, and then we need to like debrief and come to our come to our senses on what the masses really think and what is the proper direction of socialist and marxist theory um so yeah let's 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 dive in i'm excited to be here yeah um and i i just realized that i'm screen sharing that was not on purpose but it's good because we have actually some of the examples of the responses that you got such as you're lying and man, you're an academic. You're not building houses or fixing cars. Your takes on how much the working class love work are simply neither needed nor wanted. Or explain to me why I should be forced to work in order to live. I'll wait. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's a mixture of, of responses that you got. At least a couple of them, I thought. I see where that person's coming from. I like it. But I guess I'll stop sharing that right now and just say that what I wanted to open with is saying that... Uh, I'm proud to say I did not see any of this transpiring until after the fact because I wasn't on Twitter or X at the time. Uh, it was thanks to my buddy in Ontario, who we also visited, visited on tour, Eamon, aka the Solitariat. He sent me the screen cap of your initial tweet, which was um, saying that Andre Gores is the farewell to the working class is symptomatic of one of the shortfalls or shortcomings of the new left, and that being that it became anti-work. Um, and I think you might have said something else in that tweet. But do you want to kind of explain a little bit about uh, what you said, what provoked it, and maybe say some of your own thoughts about some of the whiplash, and then we'll kind of um, get into it. Yeah, I'd love to. So Andre Gortz is an interesting kind of um, theorist that comes about. He was just background for listeners here. Um, he was kind of like a, a new left philosopher. Um, you know, he he was deeply embedded in French um, leftism. Uh, so, you know, strains of Jean-Paul Sartre are deeply uh, influential on him. Um, he is uh, coming from a position that I think has been prophetic. Prophetic for both describing the scenario in which neoliberalism and the left in the era of neoliberalism, and by that I just simply mean like the, the grand structural changes to the economy from the 1970s to the present, Gortz emerges as a somewhat of a prophetic figure for the left. He emerges at a time in which we have the rise of Francois Mitterrand in France. And this is a huge moment in the sense that the Communist Party in France basically is, is, is gone from the parliamentary system. Its power is basically, is basically liquidated. Um, in that context, the philosophical milieu of French leftism coming out of 68 thought, May 68 thought, was anti-institutional, was anti-workerist, was highly critical of Marxism, for which they, in many cases, like with Foucault, uh, with Jacques Donzelo, with Gortz, uh, with many other thinkers, they were actually putting forward an argument that things like universal basic income need to be advocated. They're putting forward an argument of what they called revolutionary reformism, okay, which is assaulting the 
the, the foundation of the welfare state as we know it. Uh, after Mitterrand is out of power, a kind of more neoliberal figure, Giscard d'Estaing, comes into power in France. This, this guy basically is pushing the same type of anti-welfareist state policies as the most radical left May 68 philosophers, including Gortz, are also promoting. So this is why you have Gortz taking positions at this time, and this is in the early 1980s, when um, farewell to the proletariat, which is translated as farewell to the working class, but it's really farewell to the proletariat. Marx's understanding of the proletariat is a better translation of the text. Yeah, he that's, is that's implicitly, that. yeah, he is implicitly supporting the neoliberal turn, right? Which is basically within the parliamentary system, kind of a centrist turn. So first flag for me is located here. Why is the left promoting a kind of such a radical revision to core Marxist propositions and theoretical understandings of labor power, of understanding of the role of the working class. What he is proposing is that the structural changes brought on um, in the from the 1970s onward are ushering in a type of post-working class, what he calls post-industrial socialist horizon, in which what he calls a non-class or the excluded, what what is kind of kind of more broad, broader than what Marx theorized as the lumpen proletariat, is the new vanguard, right? And this new vanguard is the revolutionary class. Now, here's the tragic caveat or qualification to this proposal, which is that this new so-called revolutionary non-class is superior because it no longer relies on any form of power and leadership internal to itself. So immediately we have a very tricky ideological snag that I don't think Gortz and these 68ers can get themselves out of which is in Marxist understanding the ideological conundrum of what we call the petite bourgeoisie. He is formulating a philosophy of post-industrial socialism from the standpoint of the petite bourgeoisie, which is based on what I would characterize Dave and Nance as a passive aggressive relationship to this non-class, non-productive class, those excluded, what in liberal jargon today we call the marginalized, right? Gortz would be very happy with this notion of marginalization as a subjective position, which is somehow thought to be subversive, right? But right, how right, can right. a subjective position be subversive if it's not permitted or even encouraged to formulate conceptions of leadership amongst its members, right? So what I'm trying to say is that Gortz reproduces the exact problematic that we find ourselves in in today's contemporary left, which is a petite bourgeois or PMC left, which stands for a vague and overly abstract set of categories of those excluded, of those marginalized. The problem with that definition of the non-class, Gortz's revolutionary class, is that it's not defined in relationship to productive labor. And it has, in a Foucauldian sense, argued that power is so ubiquitous that everybody is basically subjected to the same form of power. So here we have the ghost of Marx returning to clarify that power doesn't work that way. And you know the other problem here, and I'll stop here, is that when you put forward that Foucauldian conception of power as just omnipotent, Right. And you have no class gradation of that understanding. You know what the problem is? Any appeal on behalf of the working class to be productivist or to be for work, you know what the accusation is going to be? That that is fascism. 
And that's exactly what Gortz dedicates almost two chapters of Farewell to the Proletariat to, which is exactly right. the, the, the quagmire of the contemporary left today, where we see people who want to argue that doing class politics equals fascism on the neoliberal left. That to me is not only offensive, but it is representative of a kind of interminable, I mean, to be honest with you guys, this is the origins of a type of cancel culture um, hyperliberalism that we have to transcend. Okay, now I'm not saying that Gortz is responsible for that, but he comes from a lineage of thought that has contributed to this very problem we are living with today. So I think that the Gortz text, and I respect your admiration for the proposition that the proletarian position has a fundamental hostility to the degradation and the paternalist capture and the horrors of wage labor. But I think the other problem with that is that what we end up with Gortz is a false dualism, whereby okay, you are either anti-work or pro-work. This you saw in the Twitter thread. This to me is not dialectical thinking. This is childish thinking. I don't think in politics that we should be working on these binaries of anti-pro. They don't make any sense because they don't capture the granularity of the power relations of class in our society, okay? So I, as you guys can tell, I have a lot of hangups with Gortz um, and this is where I'm coming from, you know? So let, I mean, let's, we can unpack things I said, but I'll stop there. So that's a lot. I, have never liked the new left um, in its influence on contemporary politics as I've understood its influence on contemporary politics. But in the last couple of years, I've become a lot more interested um, in some of these new left thinkers, or at least these people who get called new left thinkers, because in a sort of sense, they are just post-left thinkers, meaning that they are post-old left, right? And so they're, they're getting lumped in with the new left, but it's like, if you're not a part of Students for a Democratic Society, um, and if you're, you're not signing off on its program, and you're not trying to speak to it and organize it, and you're then, then getting lumped up with it seems problematic to me because the situation, when I think of the new left in the United States and the things that it kind of assumed and the ways that it burned bridges with the working class, I don't see those as being, um, well, I can't really put that on Gores, right? And okay, and I, I wanna say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm not, pronoun I'm, not, I'm not pronouncing it right. Is it because, what, what language is his name in and how are you pronouncing it? It's Gortz? Yeah. It's, yeah, no, you. Yeah, I think you're. You're right. Gortz. Is it Gors or is it Gortz? Look Gortz. At that. I think it's Gortz. Gortz. Yeah. yeah. Gortz. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. So, um, the, I, you know, I, I think anybody should be able to admire aspects of the new left, the fight for civil rights, the anti-war thing, but at the same time, the abandonment of the working class and of, uh even thinking that soldiers have a place in winning in the future is the fault of the new left from where I stand. I mean, the, the, it's, it's like the left, the new left didn't even think about soldiers. It just was anti-war, which is fair because it was the Vietnam war. But at the same time, there, there is no path forward that doesn't include uh, using the repressive apparatuses. I don't, I don't think right? No realistic path forward. And a left that doesn't think about soldiers or try to even speak to them is not one interested in winning, right? At least you can say that Lenin spoke to workers and soldiers, right? 
Um, but I also see why they were so disillusioned with the repressive apparatuses in general and thought there's no way that we can just come in and take over these places of, you know, these positions of power and therefore change things, which is, Gord I think Gord's um, most interesting point is that the system itself exists outside of these positions of power, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I want I want to get into into this the bureaucracy and the 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 way that workerism leads to fascism and stuff like that in a bit. But uh, first, I want to make sure that anything Nance that you wanted to touch on. It looked like you had a couple interjections early in, but then we'll get back to Tut. No, I'm. Uh... I'm just really interested I because I there's things that um, I just don't think Gors is doing, but I also appreciate uh, your caution, not even your caution, but your um, correct diagnosis um, of of a lot of the trends at the time. But I I I don't see it in Gors, but I'm also I really want to explore it more. Yeah. And part of this is, I think, also that, you know, you have to read him in his time with intention. Like, there's a great new book by um, uh, Zamora and Yager um, on the history of UBI, Universal Basic Income, called Welfare Against Markets. And it is striking that both Foucault and Gortz are basically finding Milton Friedman's ideas of the entrepreneurial society and of UBI as more liberatory than a society that Marx envisioned that would socialize through productive labor, um, the path to a more egalitarian socialist society. See, see, In, see, see, that's that, that's that to me where, is that's where I'm like, I don't see that at all. But keep going. I mean, no, but this, yeah, yes, I know. UBI, no, no, no. What UBI, I what I, this yeah. I'm pointing I'm pointing to something, Dave, which is how Gortz beyond the text ends up, because I think it's always important that we situate thinkers in this way where we actually situate them within the political matrices of their time. And what kind of positions were they taking? What what exactly were they supporting? Like those those things actually retroactively mean something to the text to the theory itself. And I think in this case, it definitely does. Because the other thing, what he's talking about here is taking a kind of, he, he's very big on this notion of taking the kind of withering of the state, this Marxist idea, which is frankly a pretty vague idea. But you know, he's arguing for the withering of the state basically through the apparatus of things like UBI and through the expansion of a new form of politicization over a sphere which is basically kind of like civil society in which we politicize daily life, right? This is a very new left conception, the revolution of everyday life, that whole idea. It's explicitly against that. No, actually, no, actually, he, he, no, 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 again, he's moving away from productive labor and political economy as a site that is most fecund or most vulnerable for political revolution. He's saying that's not going to happen there. He's saying that um, the structural changes is not in the world because he says that Marx's traditional conception of a broader area relied on skilled craftsmen and lay labor to basically make a daytime partnership with, with true proletarians who have, have like, like no future and are completely discarded from the labor process. He says that that, that they take on this over and, and that the most revolutionary class now are that, that old proletariat, which, which can be, be summarized through the end of the, the Communist Manifesto as we are, we are nothing, make us all. We are, we are nothing, make us all. The, the status of their ontological predicament in capitalism, and he was, by the way, hugely inspired by the Black Panthers, 
because, because the Black Panthers, Panthers were saying something similar. Mm -hmm. But you, but you see, there's a very crazy, crazy historical sort of transposition that takes place, whereby those who advocated a lumpen proletarian centric conception of revolution, which I would characterize course as doing, as well as, well as the Panthers, they, they couldn't see that the transition to what neoliberalism actually brought about in a material sense ended up making them side with a libertarian form of neoliberalism. So what I'm trying to say is that neoliberalism in its libertarian um, anti-statist, anti-welfare statist thrust, you see these left radicals ended up becoming and this is very paradoxical, but they became the kind of prophets of exactly the horror that our current society is now structured upon. They didn't intend for that to happen. So this is like how the dialectic of history works, right? This is also why like we have to situate people politically, like it matters, especially theoreticians. So, so uh, those things I think are... Um, I mean, kind of what I'm talking about here also is the big debate on Foucault and neoliberalism, right? And and frankly, what I'm also raising is um, the evacuation of a, uh, of the centrality of a focus on political economy within 68 thought, right? And the new left, right? There's something deeply inadequate about that, right? There is There was an embrace of a kind of anti-working class sentiment, which argued, Revolutionary reformism argued that the working class had already been absorbed into bourgeoisie and Marx's proposal of a primary schism between two classes, bourgeoisie and proletariat, is no longer happening. And Andre Gortz is part of this. He's part of that. In other words, part of the problem of the new left was the idea that the Marx's, Marx's proletariat as a revolutionary class, which... Lenin had the idea that the proletariat is defined by their complete domination under capitalism. Gortz argues that that domination is no longer total. It's no longer total. And it has been absorbed. So you have kind of like a hybrid bourgeois proletarian fused into one. But the practical consequence of that fusion is that basically revolution now is basically like bourgeois in some sense. So we we lose all class legibility. And I think this actually means also for for today that if we if we if we lean on a Gortzian framework of thinking about class, class power, etc. I mean, for him, I don't really think that he would see any problem with a kind of with the PMC. I think that Gortz would probably say that your guys's um strong critique of PMC ideology, okay? is a non-starter because part of what Gortz is also talking about is that ideological power no longer matters, right? Because the class schism is no longer central. Read his chapter on power, right? This acephalic idea of power, non-centralized power. Power is everywhere, this kind of Foucauldian idea. It's and I can read some passages from it later, if you'd like, to really elucidate it. But mm -hmm. I think this is a where theory meets practice and where we find a deeply symptomatic and problematic conception of power take place. It's a kind of post-class understanding. And the truth is, our contemporary moment is riddled with the return of class problem is, is that we're relying on old philosophical models to face those realities that are inadequate. And I, I think that Gortz, Gortz has a lot of inadequacy. I mean, I don't want to bash him totally because I do think that Farewell to the Working Class is a, a well-structured manifesto. You know, he starts off with whatever, 12 points. I went through each of the 12 points and I either said these are haven't been proven historically, or they are founded off of conditions, historical conditions, which completely no longer apply to our present. So, which is exactly what he does to standard 
traditional worldview Marxism in the I think it's actually I think it's actually not even it is that but I'm also talking about specific um misjudgments about the way that the neoliberal system used 68 philosophy of libertarian freedom into a new regime of austerity he he had nothing to say about the new disciplinary society that neo neoliberalism gave birth to by the 1990s where all of that all of the return of class became concretized he couldn't see that he literally couldn't see it i would be fascinated to sit down with him now and see i mean but part of the problem is is that you know there's a generational issue with the new left where even jacobin magazine a year ago was celebrating gortz as a prophet of anti-work but those critiques only go so far for me because we need to ser seriously ask ourselves and i want to hear what you think do you do you understand the working class today by and large to either intuitively or intellectually right either kind of rationally thought through or just sort of as an intuitive position relate to work through this prism of a kind of anti-work orientation whereby whereby and let's think practically here the abolition of work should be a position that we all advocate see to me it becomes a question of political demand Gortz is basically saying that uh in a very total sense that the society of work is over that automation is replacing it that didn't happen that's not gonna happen right i get I into this in the afterward i get it i get into this into the in the afterward of the my time energy but, but let me let me ask you this now from your position I understand you guys or reading time energy and things of this nature I could summarize and correct me if I'm wrong is that in a sense uh there need there 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 is not I don't I don't think you would claim that anti-work is a a widely accepted position amongst the, the working class however you define it but it's just not and I'm not sure that but but you're also you're also seem to suggest that it remains i don't know like a highly valuable demand and horizon by which we should advocate for politics so i want to actually work through this with you as a political demand because this kind of goes back to the zizekian point that you and i debated over messenger dave about um impossible demands right 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 and, yeah right well, and so you just brought up you it's funny because that's the connection to it, that conversation and this one um we'd have to have mikey here for him to actually defend that position i'm not going to try to do it and so that's on the level of impossible demands but also at the level of anti-work mikey is just 100 percent down with anti-work we're not um and there's a little bit of nuance here i i basically we're anti anti work um and we're for sublating the uh the sentiment the spirit the 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 thing the impulse driving anti work which we think is something that needs to be upheld dignified cultivated spread people need to develop some kind of consciousness of oh fuck man my whole life has been job centric i would like to have a life outside of jobs like that is important and a person who's like looking at their life like that and going i'm out man i'm fucking against this shit like we're for that but also the anti-work subreddit and the anti-work facebook groups and all of these spaces are full of these 35 year old mouth breathing basement dwelling lazy fucking sacks of shit who basically usually i mean they they live off of takeout and they don't leave their houses and they don't have to do things and associate with people who make the world go around. That's troubling. We don't like that aspect of it, but that doesn't capture or right. represent the totality of the people who see something in anti-work. And the anti-work spaces do end up being a good place for people to vent about their bosses, to swap information about how to skirt things. Um, and 
I think it's really important that like, we think about this through the notion of what Eric Olin Wright calls the contradictory class position, which is yeah. another name for the petit bourgeois. What is that? The petit bourgeois is a particular form of consciousness that's very important to understand. Why? Well, because it's a consciousness which has, in a sense, a, a split subjectivity in a Lacanian idea. It has a knowledge of both the proletarian and the kind of trappings of what a bourgeois position could be. Now, some have argued that this position has dominated the idea of political demands on the left. In this stretching back, I mean, it, this is a question of historical periodization. Somebody like Christopher Lash saw these emerge in bohemian leftism that emerged um, because you see one of the things that's very important as a side point the petit bourgeois a position had in um the netherlands um partially inspired by gortz and this anti-institutional mantra came to power and uh, again in zamora uh in zamora's book uh, welfare against markets he really articulates this quite nicely and what you basically see is a kind of um a kind of bohemian leftism which is taking this conception of the non-class and almost fetishizing them as the agent of expression of liberation that all other agents in society must adhere to and what that actually means is that you lose all specificity regarding class origin, class position, and class experience what, what, based in what? relationships of, of, of like existing domination. What they basically mean to do is to take the non-class, what Gortz calls the non-class, which is, uh, a, quote, a non-force without objective social importance. It is a class of people fully excluded from society. So you see the left then becomes fast uh, obsessed in this Gortzian new left framework of conceiving of demands for the liberation of that class. And I think that there's an ideological disavowal that takes place in that process, whereby the left spokespeople, and this can include the PMC, end up advocating that leftist revolution is for this obscure downtrodden class. And what they paradoxically do is they completely liquidate the agency of this class and they pander to them. They basically treat them like children. Okay. I That's love this. And I agree. I agree. I, I've been driven crazy about this ever since I kind of discovered the new left, right? Because I was first sold on the old left before I ever. I'm really into... sorry to take down Gortz for you. And I don't mean to like, no, I know no, that no, there's no, value no, you're here. You're not I though, but it. you're not though, but you're not, you're not though. Everything you're saying keeps engaging with my understanding of the, the general tendencies of the new left, but it does not engage with Gortz in this actual book, which we just read cover to cover together. And we, so we were very fresh on it. And I know you were just revisiting it. I don't know how much of it you revisited. I want to give you a chance to actually address this. But he is not talking about the lumpen proletariat, and that's very, very, very clear. He's not talking about the lumpen proletariat. He is talking about workers who are intellectual workers who cannot identify with the working class. He's talking about the PMC, and he does. He wants to say that the PMC is a non-class. Well, most people want to say that the PMC is not a class, which is why I've kind of skirted the whole question, and I just say professional, the professionals and managers of capital, um, which is still PMC. But the, uh, at least in the acronym, but the, he doesn't talk about the marginalized, powerless people who don't have work. He's talking, he's talking on the one side of intellectual laborers who cannot identify with their work. And then people who work at Walmart on the, on the, during the Christmas season and construction during the, uh, the summer, which is me. This and, has been me my whole life. And I gig work. never had access. And gig work. Well, it, he was prefiguring what, what came about with gig work, but I don't know anybody except for people that I've met on this tour who came representing unions who actually belongs to unions or has a path forward in an institution, a workspace where they are planning on being there in two years. 
I've never known anyone who's like that. And he's speaking of people who have never known anyone like that. Lupin proletariats are like homeless people. They're people who've been, they're ethnic minority groups who've been ghettoized. They're, I get it, like they're sex workers. They're, they're, the, they're on the outskirts or the margin. He never touches on that in the entire farewell to the proletariat. And so I, I, I just I want you to be able to respond to that, but I, but I just I've been feeling like the need to push back on that every time you bring it up because I do hate that about the new left, but I don't see it in this text. So I'm sorry to tell you, but the implications of the non-class of this, um, the non-producers who he says are the only ones capable of producing a liberatory act. Why? Because it's a liberal ethical maxim that he's after, which would be, and this is actually very much makes Gortz an early degrowth communist thinker, actually. Uh, what he wants to argue is that only those proletarians completely excluded from productive labor are going to be most revolutionary because they are the ones that can put forward a rejection of capitalist accumulation ethics, which he thinks the subjects bound up in factories and industrial labor. And here it, it becomes very vague because, I mean, he doesn't get into the granularities like Negri does of like service workers, but you already see that he's falling into a kind of Negriist theory of the multitude and the precariat as the revolutionary class, which, by the way, has, has not borne any fruit as a a class politics that can truly contest hegemonic power so he is he's reading the grundrisse he's reading marx's fragment on machines he's overly optimistic about the power of ubi and he is working on this idea that we need to expand the realm of what he calls the realm of autonomy and the realm of necessity we need to lessen the realm of necessity being the state right Right. Okay, on the one hand, right, he's not saying that the the um, that we need to fundamentally take over the word the state apparatus through a class revolution. And why? We need to not do that. But right? Why is he not saying that? He's not saying that because he's already abandoned the Marxist and the Leninist idea that there even is a distinction between bourgeoisie and proletariat, which I think is like cripples his whole project from the very get go. Well, the PMC. <laughs> Thesis, the PMC thesis is the thesis that on the one side, woke scolds, radical liberals, identity politics, cancel culture, all of this is a mode of the PMC that essentially virtue hoards its time energy, relative time energy privilege over the rest of the working people, masses, whatever. Um, but on the other side, and 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 on that side, really, it is a sort of inversion of identity politics. Like it's a way of turning identity politics back on its head and reminding people who are weaponizing it against the working class, "Hey, actually, you are a part of something that is necessary to the reproduction of this class division that creates all of this oppression in the first place. And it's more essential than whiteness. It's more essential than being a guy or being a part of the patriarchy. It's more essential than any of that, right? Like the PMC thesis drives that home on the on that side. But on the other side, it is the it is the primary contradiction in the old left, one that the old left could not overcome. And it's and considering the fact that we saw the developments that we've been talking about all tour, that Elton and I talked about in the entire PMC course that is up on my channel. Um, that Barbara Aaron Wright is developing in her first main work on the professional managerial class, um, the game changed. And so I'm very interested in this tension between on the one side, oh, it's an actual class, and on the other side being, no, it's a non-class. Well, but it yeah. is, but, but no, hold on, but it is a thing though, right? And so it's being a thing means that the proletariat and the bourgeoisie are blurred and that the, the, the okay i want you to maybe take a moment to establish and i think we can all unpack this for the audience i think we need to um what is gore saying is essentially different now what did taylorism do what is its role 
in this incoherence, because I understand not liking a fact that someone else is positing and suspecting that they're wrong or that you don't like it because of where you think it takes people. I, I, I get saying, well, if you look at his moment, this is what he's a part of. I get a sort of policy reductionism. So if he ever voted a certain way, kind of taking his theory and putting it onto that, I get this other people reduction. I, I, I get it, but also what is he saying is unique about the situation um, in terms of a diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, cause I get not liking that he makes these class divides blurry or, or indistinguishable, but why are they indistinguishable according to Gortz? Okay. And I think so, I, I do want, Nan I do want Nance to be able to touch on that question himself as well. So sure. but, but, Nance, if you want to jump in, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I, I think, um, do think it is undeniable that the, the mode of production has, has changed things and, um, farewell to the to the proletariat does resonate because it seems like um the, i mean there is no more proletariat and and i i came to that uh position before ever knowing who andre gorse was um we are so so instrumentalized and so fungible and so and i guess that kind of is the point of the proletariat in the first place um but it really has turned us all into just non-thinking, like machinic parts. And there are there's such a huge reserve army of labor that like there there is no constancy, there's no consistency. Like people are constantly moving from gig to gig to gig. Um, there's this PMC that themselves have been de-skilled. And so they're all just kind of running on autopilot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Does that uh, make sense? Does uh, that, yeah. do you, do you think that is enough for the audience to understand what, what is motivating Gore's, uh, disillusionment in the, the thesis of the dictatorship of the sure. proletariat? Well, that's not we can we can address the his response to the dissolution of the dictatorship of the proletariat which was something that was widely held after the intervention of nikos palensis um the the greek uh, marxist who tried to like a lot of 68 philosophers completely radically revise core marxist tenets which i think was problematic but for courts the age of scientific Taylorism is um, reaching a conclusion, according to him, for Marxism's possibility of centering the agency of the subjects that are most proximal to the factory process. And he argues that it was skilled workers and downwardly mobile proletarians that formed the partnership, the unity, that was the backbone of what traditional Marxism saw as the process of revolutionary seizure of the state. Okay. And um, what has happened now is that the working class now is in a position of a peer reliance, politically speaking, on a consume. So their labor power has been usurped, has been removed. And what they now have vis a vis their agency and the kind of ideological state apparatus of that right, agent right. is governed by consumerism, a logic of consumerism. Um, and therefore, the traditional working class in the Western society since the neoliberal revolution has become pacified vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to productive labor. It is what, in a sense, Richard Sennett refers to as the infantilization of the adult worker, which I think is... Yeah. A 100%. very uh, accurate phrase. Now, okay, those are processes which are real, which we can all see before our very eyes. Again, let us revisit my claim here. Okay, the claim well, that, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. To to because I feel like this is the I I, de I want you to be able to revisit that 
sure claim Go ahead. in light of having sort of set up this this problem because I think it's a real problem and it sure and a big part of the the issue I think with understanding where we're coming from is that we are not attached to any uh immediate existing political movement or group or anything because we are convinced that the problems of the old left are problems we can't get out of but that doesn't mean that the new left has the correct solutions gore's posit solutions that are not anti-work that would actually piss off a lot of anti-work people i do want to be able to come back to that but first we have to set up what's sure. changed the situation what, what he what Gortz, what, no, Gortz, no, Gortz, what Gortz proposes by the way what, what Gortz proposes is that in the passivity of that experience we now have an opportunity to think of politicizing domains of social life that are outside of productive labor right now, if you think about that proposal for a second and you step back and you also cogitate on that with his other hypothesis, which is the class conflict as we've known it is over, who do you think is going to be the arbiters of the politicization of the domain of everyday life? It will be the professional managerial class. It no, will that's be- That's exactly what he's against though. He's it's against. Not, no, I, I, I'll just, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, I'm not saying that he. I'm not saying. I'm saying he couldn't see it. He couldn't no. see it. Do you, he you see how it played out? But give the devil his due. We're at this point in the conversation where we're trying to give the devil his due. Fair. We to say that he doesn't see something is outside of the scope of what we're trying to do at this point in the conversation. He and was so trying to he's vehemently, vehemently opposed. He's vehemently, the only time he gets nasty in the whole book is this idea that domestic work or that work fall, that falls outside of the realm of production should be waged. That, that people should be paid a, a UBI or some kind of a wage on the basis of the fact that they are doing care work. He's coming out against that version of neoliberal feminism. And he's vehemently opposed to the he says, we need to maximize the realm of autonomy outside of heteronomous labor by saying, okay, what is necessary productive labor? Put that over here. Let people do what they do outside of that. They'll self-organize, give them that freedom. He's trying to allow communists no, to, I know, I know, I know. And to that's uphold why... on the one side the more communalist tendencies and on the other side those more libertarian ones. He is setting it up to be able to do that. But that's separate from what we're trying to do here which is what did taylorism do and so i just want to like really drive home that taylorism didn't just de-skill and uh lower lower jobs and make lower people like replaceable which it did but it also monopolized skills into what we call the pmc okay but then those themselves have become de-skilled and so that his point is that at the time that marx is writing empirically the working class leaders are people who've done it all within, say, the factory that he's looking at or that Engels is looking at. These are working class leaders who've earned the respect through merit, and that is through actual skill. Those people have been replaced by people who only hold those positions due to their loyalty to the system, right? That is a fundamental deadlock, if, and that, that, that is ubiquitous across the entire society. That's a problem that we have to tarry with, that we actually have to think past. And it's not going to get, we can't just overcome it by saying, well, the working class got mobilized again during Occupy or Bernie. Like, that's not enough. To what working class, right? It's the people who, in large part, don't want to have to make their whole lives centered around jobs, but they are in tension with people who, on the other side, want to make their whole identity into being a worker, who, which is the way that the old left lent itself to workerism and what we call working class identity politics, which is a dead end as well. And in fact, probably more dangerous than anti-work. Okay, so I think that's probably a bit more of our position based out of, I think probably the most crucial part of this text. Um, and I just want to make sure that we actually get that set here before you bring it back to your point. Sorry to interrupt. So, Gortz is trying in a philosophical sense to work with this Hegelian idea of the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity, right? And so he's taking the state as a reality. It's not a Hegelian idea. What? I mean, this, this is an idea that goes back 2,500 years. This is the whole okay. idea of Otium in the first but, place. Well, that's fair, but he's really working in a philosophical kind of modernity model, which let me just finish my point, where he's arguing that 
the realm of freedom, the realm of autonomy. This is why he's a libertarian hyphen socialist, right? Sure, he can be against UBI in the way that you specified it, but he's for then the expansion of a certain model of the entrepreneurial society, which he saw Milton Friedman as championing. He's for that. Uh, why? Because it is going to eradicate the welfare state vestiges, right? It is going to promote this ubiquity of the adoption of a kind of hyper-libertarian individualism and a politicization of domains of social life. You see, this becomes a problem ideologically, which we are now living in the wake of, which is the oversaturation of everything being political. When 90% of what the left thinks is political doesn't qualify as political. That happens when you abandon a political economic outlook. And Gortz was doing that. He was do he was saying that the expansion of the position of the subjective position of the non-class, uh, and I, I grant your point, it's broader than the lumpen proletariat. I grant you that. Uh, but he says this must be the model by which we ad adhere our whole praxis, right? We need to expand it. You see, the immediate problem there is that, okay, we see the rise of a new bureaucracy in neoliberalism and the de-skilling of that bureaucracy and the internal class fractures of that new bureaucracy, what we call the PMC, while at the same time holding on to a conception of the realm of freedom and in its adva advancements through this vague conception of the liberated subject of the non-class, right? Or what we say, like the marginalized. So it's it's a hyper-liberal theory of subjectivity, which is problematic because it doesn't allow us actually to contest power whatsoever. If we were to uh, bring back a more Marxist-centric model and apply it to some of Gortz's shortcomings. And again, I'm I'm with you that Gortz is a nuanced and worth reading thinker. I'm not trying to discard him or anything like that. I'm just saying he was duped by the ruse of history. Okay? Yeah, I think he was. And that's okay. I think every, Marxist, I mean, every Marxist has been duped by the ruse of sure, history. Well, well nah, that's not fair. Uh, we, can, we can talk about that in a moment because if you take that, then you fall into a kind of... Um, you risk falling into an anti-intellectual pessimism in which no... I'm there. I'm there. We're there. Guilty well, as charged. Okay. Let's not, let's not fall down that point yet. Just stay stay with fair me enough, for a enough. moment. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, uh, what we have is the trappings here of a conception of the politicization of, uh, of freedom vis-a-vis an entrepreneurial society and the expansion of local alternative economies, which is founded on a premise of a anti So it's accepting that capitalism has politicized for the everyday worker. And I mean here by like elections, right? Like, or I mean like um, the framework by which we are permitted to see social antagonisms is structured through consumer logics, right? That's the primary sort of glue of the ideological state apparatuses that allow us to see social reality. I think that Marx's point is slightly different than that, which is that socialist education needs to equip people with seeing a different line of how the power functions and operates, okay? And I think that Gortz is basically too accepting of this idea and basically creating individual liberated libertarian subjects who revolt, but revolt without solidarity because he has kneecapped the idea of leadership. It's this very kind of Nietzschean, Foucauldian idea that all, you know, any kind of aspiration to a leader, he even says that um, he makes a, 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 a really vulgar homology between like, state socialism and Nazism. Like, go back and read what he talks yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's yeah. terrible. This whole thing on the fear, oh, where he says like any working class all. leader, any working class leader it's, that no, would try no, to no, organize no, the no, class is like the Fuhrer. That's, 
That's nonsense. And that is exactly what too many think on the left today. Too many think this. That's yeah. why when you say, yeah, my politics is class first, we have now the legacy of the new left and not just Gortz, but a whole lineage of this is why ideas matter. I'm not an idealist, but they matter. We now have this kind of um, intuition that is embedded into leftists to think that class politics fundamentally risks fascism, blah, 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 blah. This to me is a disaster. And you must agree with me that it's a disaster. Do you not? I do not agree that the homology between Stalin and Hitler is a disaster or a terrible injustice or that it's like that totalitarianism. I didn't say Stalin. I said state socialism, which could also include like Engelsian Marxism. Yeah. That is disastrous. He's that. Yeah, go ahead. He so. I think that's a more important and nuanced point that I would like to get into. But right now, I want to take it back to this welfare state thing um, and say that he, okay, so the only similarity between Gortz and, say, Friedman or someone else who is more of a right wing UBI guy is that he does see that welfare is demeaning. But, but for someone like Friedman, it's a win because you can gut the welfare state and then you can just give everybody a check. And then, so it's a, it's a way of dismantling welfare state for Gortz though. He's very, very opposed to the, it's not free money. I it's, it, so he's opposed to the idea that it's free money. Um, it's, and it's not just, Oh, because you know, more like Thomas Paine, the idea that, you know, we're all a part of this earth and then we were born into it after the, you know, division of property. And so we, we deserve something back in exchange for the fact that we're born into this place already divided up. So we deserve something or it's, it's not even like this idea that, oh, we're all harvesting data for the machine. And so we all deserve something back for that. All of those are interesting ideas or something to those ideas, but what he's advocating for is just not UBI. And when I was, uh, I admit to not having read the book yet about um, welfare and markets, the Jaeger book, uh, I did read an article about it, nothing, and it resembles anything he's talking about, though. And so uh, maybe the book itself is, is is a bit better in its in its critique of Gortz. But the issue at stake is that he's saying, no, you work 22,000 hours for your society. You get paid a living wage at, to have a dignified life based on that amount, meaning that that would work for gig people. That would work for gig people. That does, doesn't mean anything to somebody who's been an electrician his whole life and is happy being an electrician. Okay. I've got someone in mind who we were talking uh, with in Seattle. And so it's like, there's, there's, I don't know, to me, it's a really big difference. It's like, it's not free money and it's not a handout and it's not charity, whereas it is for some left thinkers, some right thinkers. And it's not a way of replacing the welfare state. It's a get rid of all of that take out the job nature of work. And so this is why he's not anti-work. And I feel I at least need to share this with the audience. He's not anti-work because he's anti the ideology of workerism, right? But he's he's absolutely uh, repetitively clear, painstakingly clear that there is work that has to be done if it's not distributed across the population and everyone kind of does their does a part of it it's going to fall on somebody now some people might make their whole identity into doing it their whole lives but their lives are broken and they've been cheated of the opportunity to have a real life because they're spending their whole fucking life doing other people's laundry washing other people's toilets whatever now the more important thing is that outside of say chores the fact that everybody should wash their own toilets and do their own laundry is the basic idea that ball bearings and computer chips cannot be efficiently made by people who are going to sell you shit at the farmer's market. Libertarians do not have a solution for this. Your average libertarian socialist doesn't have a solution for this. And I've never met an anarchist who has a solution to this. Ball bearings and computer chips have to be produced in effective ways that save us time. And so when you have that largely automated and then people can go to work four hours a day, 10 hours a week, 22,000 hours in your lifetime and you just clock the hours 
to do your basic societal chores, the rest of it, being a, being a professor of philosophy, being a yoga instructor, being a, a, a chef who makes really fancy foods, you can do that in your autonomous time. You can do that in your cooperative time, but that would obviously be done outside of your societal chores. And the, the, he sets that up. That is not that, that that runs counter to the general tendency of anti-work. It runs counter to this, I think, hypostitional idea of you know fully automated gay space luxury communism. It runs counter to. A lot of the things that kind of drive us crazy rhetorically or even strategically in anti-work spaces, I wish that anti-work people would actually read Gord's. So I don't want to make him responsible for anti-work because he is trying to take that basic sentiment that we've had our lives robbed of us and then still say, no, there's still like this Marxist kernel of truth here. We do need to take necessary productive labor outside of that which cannot be automated and render it uh, something where we're, we're all, we all still have to do it. So that the, the realm of heteronomy is still there. It's not there for your average uh, post-Marxist. It is there for Gortz. I think that's very important. And what did you, Nance, I know you got something and then Daniel, you can take it away. Yeah, just just that, um, that realism of dealing with um, the things that must be done um, and what that looks like. I don't think he's ever definite on that, but I do think that's something that must be uh, dealt with with the, the sharing out of necessary labor and reproduction um but i i just think it's like he's he's very realistic about current conditions i don't know about any of his prescriptions um i'm definitely uh looking forward to going back and situating him historically but i do think his diagnosis is undeniable of current conditions i think what he gets wrong we can either be graceful or we can just say that doesn't matter anyway because we've moved beyond it into this further um further automation we've been further removed from power um we've been mm -hmm. further atomized um mm -hmm. and not even atomized but fractured in a way that makes us there's no center to those atoms yeah outside I, of I, I i i when he says on page 80 for one example that the realm of freedom can never arise out of material processes but can only be established by a constitutive act, which, aware of its free subjectivity, asserts itself as an absolute end in itself within each individual. Only the non-class of non-producers is capable of such an act, for it alone embodies what lies beyond productivism, the rejection of the accumulation ethic and the dissolution of all classes. Okay, now hold on. In a society in which many respectable theorists are talking about not only the return of class, but the return of class with the neo-feudal hue to it. Mm -hmm. Imagine what insidious fetishization of people deprived, those uh, on the margins, deprived of any relationship, productive material processes, to say that they then are the vanguard for your conception of how to revolutionize capitalism, I think is an offense to yourself and to them, right? On the one hand, on the other hand, the complete refusal of solidarity at the site of production under the notion that it would repeat the fascisms of the past is another assault on not only on Marxism, but on the working class as it is. Okay, so this to me is an example of a sentiment which is from a milieu that was dealing with antagonisms of the capitalist system, which have now, which in hindsight had serious blind spots. What would Gortz say to the neo feudal thesis? I don't think that his model would work. Okay, and the other thing I want to say here is that uh, the other thing I want to say here is that. We have a tradition in Marxism for the introduction of consciousness to the working class, both the working class that is split between different relations to the gener generation of surplus value, by the way, strategically, 
there is a um, higher value for contesting capitalism when you forge uh, solidarity with particular stratums of the proletarian class, which is has the most proximity to the generation of surplus value, which is what is afforded. That surplus is afforded by the fact that the labor of those proletarians is a commodity. Therefore, the Marxist proposal is for the abolition of that particular form of work qua commodification. In Gortz's notion of his anti-materialist, anti-productivist notion completely, I don't see how that class of workers, and we can talk about what percentage they are today and so on and so forth, but I don't see how that class could have an emancipation. And I don't, and when he forecloses solidarity between the non-class and that traditional proletarian, I think that's a very catastrophic mistake, which Marx and Engels never wanted to do. Marx and Engels did not want to just say this rigid uh, industrial class are the most important because of their strategic proximity to labor power. They're also thinking about how to create solidarity with they're going to privilege certain agencies, but they're going to also think the procedure of the seizure of power vis-a-vis -vis the organization of the working class. And I think that what we've had take place is such a profound anome, alienation in general, on behalf of people like us that come from working class backgrounds. And you can call this through the kind of... Um, uh you know professionalization of certain and and even the fact that working class people are structurally excluded from living lives of dignity because you know as a side point i want to say this uh, go study uh jacques rancier's books on the proletariat of the 19th century and ask what did he discover were the core of the proletarian demands it may sound like liberal but it's actually not because the core of their demands were for leading lives of dignity and receiving recognition, which was barred to them in bourgeois society. Right. 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 And of course right. he studies, he studies actually in a very interesting way for you. Uh, I think Ron Cier, you should guys should do some episodes on Jacques Ron Cier because you know what he studies? He studies worker intellectuals. He has a book yeah, called yeah. Pro Proletarian right. Nights, which is a study right. worker intellectuals, what were they writing at night with, in their off time? What were they studying? What were they thinking about? What were their dreams? And lo and behold, we do find an anti-work position, for sure. But we find a position of a dream of work beyond exploitation and a recognition that existing work can never be anything but exploitation. So there's a recognition the of that impossibility. That's the proletarian mm, position. And that's the proletarian position. position. The proletarian position is not the petit bourgeois position in this case. The petit bourgeois position would be like, ah, well, we can we can reform and I can be in charge of the reforms because I know what it's like. It's this kind of paternalist thing. Right. It's this PMC thing. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, Gortz has this notion of the expansion of the realm of freedom through this libertarian orientation, which is all open to entrepreneurship, which is open to alternative economies, which I think is even open to um, uh, uh, property ownership as so uh, as long as uh, uh, it's not productivist and it's not You're muted, no, Nance. It's not forcing, right? It's not forcing people to adhere to some um, worker policy, which would either be um, Stakovite, you know, these guys in the uh, the USSR under Stalin, who created kind of this really interesting hyper work ethic, which was communist, but mirrored the Protestant work ethic that we have, right? This is the kind of thing that Gortz is opposed to. He's very opposed to this. My position, guys, is that by witnessing what happened in the Bernie Sanders campaign, 
my position is that socialist politics in a, and now here i'm being like super strategic and like non-theoretical let's say uh must face the reality not of uh a ubiquity of workerist ideology but rather must find a way to integrate the reality that the loss of dignity the infantilization of the adult worker okay is, the loss not, is not the loss of dignity and the infantilization of the adult worker is not going to lead all of those adult workers into a petty bourgeois bohemian thing of like let's live on a commune and not be consumerist that's not what it's going to do that's not what it is doing so how do we realistically work with existing demands because you guys run the risk of being just as naive uh, uh by suggesting oh well that you know everyone can kind of adhere to this kind of um that then becomes a disciplinary device in some sense i'm trying to think what becomes a disciplinary device what becomes a disciplinary device is this austerity logic of basically what we must expand as the kind of revolutionary subject for politics is this non-class position which is outside of labor completely and which basically has no aspirations for social recognition has no aspirations for leadership and just kind of wants to exist in a pure space this for gortz is kind of like the horizon of what capitalism is producing for people and i don't think that that is actually how things are working or how they are going I think actually the majority of people are desperate for dignified work. They're desperately looking for it. They're not finding it. They're not finding it. And um, there needs to be a serious return, not to the old FDR welfare state, which was problematic because it was a class compromise position. Right, right, right. It was a class compromise position. Like we see right now with um, Soreb uh, Amari at Compact. He just wrote an article where he's ar he's arguing that because of what the left is doing in response to the Hamas terrorism of Israel, this is a perfect chance for my people to take over the center because the far left latched on to, at least rhetorically, the center, Bidenism. Hmm? And now uh, they're revealing themselves as kind of um, sycophantic uh kids that are kind of um in some fantasy world of far leftism but look at his alternative is 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 amari's alternative at all in line with something that will expand the realm of freedom for for the vast majority of the working class i don't think that it will i don't think that it will uh so i don't know i mean I, i'm not saying that i have a solution but I'm, I'm skeptical I, I of both. I'm skeptical of both positions. I'll just stop there. I'm 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 in the weeds. If it wasn't your fault, I, I'm lost. So I get so Rabbi Mari is controversial. I get that you don't see that he has a solution. I get that he's basically blaming the infantilized or the the childish like left, the infantile left. What we were just on something else. That was an example. What was what was your point again before you brought that in? What my point is that Gortz contributed to a thinking, a political subjectivity in general, from a position which is is totally liquidated the agency of the working class as as we live it and face it today, because of the reasons I've already cited. Uh, yeah. The 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 trepidation around leadership, the trepidation around uh, representation, the trepidation around solidarity, uh, the insistence that uh, political change will not happen within. Well, when you say that, then you basically have given carte blanche power for the continuation of hyper finance capitalism to just kind of wreak and continue to wreak its havoc and what yeah. you end up with is a kind of liberal ethics which still accepts that okay consumer ideology is kind of what the horizon of possibility is the best we can ask for is kind of like a small home and recycle 
and kind of do our best. But we don't want to make any appeals to collective power because that's just going to make us fascists, right? And class is dead, uh, power is everywhere. The be it's, it's very uh, ascetic. It, it's saintly. It's utopian socialism. In an article that I've recently written, I argue that 68 philosophy is a utopian socialist philosophy. And I think it's problematic for that reason. Because cool. it doesn't it doesn't want to deal with the hard question of actually contesting state power and building so, working class solidarity. Thank you. Yeah, Nate, that's where you got there. I uh I really do appreciate your your critique. Um and it's, I mean, you're definitely raising points that I agree with that I haven't, I guess, made the connection to. Um, but I, I keep going back to, um, I really agree with Gores on, on some things that he's saying as a diagnosis of, of current conditions or of his time, contemporary conditions. I do feel like um, we need to come up with a, a, a new way to to see collective power um i really like his focus on um like the tools of conviviality i i, I love that um i i think he's doing something interesting with with moral choice where he's trying to give us some agency back when it comes to to our own personal morality and and um i think he's realistic about the fact that we can't see ourselves in our work because our quote unquote productive work is already non-productive. So I, I, it like he, he is kind of, um, can't, I don't know. I, I can't think what I was trying to say, but the, the fact that we're in factories producing Hannah Montana bobblehead bobbleheads for all of our right. lives, we're doing that 60 right. hours a day. There is no dignity in that. So we, right. we do need to find a new way to take back dignity for ourselves. Um, yeah, what do you, what, right, that's right, that's right. That, that That's the thing I was going to bring up too, and I want you to elaborate on it, Nance, is that productivism as an ideology is masking the fact that most of what we consider productive is not actually productive, which means that if the working class were to go from in itself to for itself, seize the means, what you're going to have is a bunch of people who identify with the necessity of these non-productive things and think of it as productive and then think of themselves as fucking uh, saints for maintaining what is essentially exploitative, wasteful bullshit, not just Hannah Montana bobbleheads and so it, it, it but of course that's part of it he's not saying get rid of ball bearings and computer chips but the point is is that the actual system as it is set up right now you can't just seize it and then uh, continue to occupy its positions of power just changing out the leadership right like it needs to be fundamentally restructured and someone like baudrillard is so black pilled on this that's why his mirror of production book is so controversial for marxists because he's essentially saying there's no such thing as production anymore and that we've actually turned this into a fetish and blah 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 but he doesn't pave a way forward gortz actually shows an alternative and it's and i don't you know i see how uh these tendencies there's a lot of tendencies he's trying to sublate into this project that are on their own dead ends but that's the thing like his foucault like how he brings in foucault how he brings in sartre how he brings in all these other things He's bringing it all in to this vision of an actual way forward that seems a lot more plausible than, oh, let's just double down on trying to get the workers to wake up and seize the means. Your, it seems like that is your solution. It seems like that is uh, Daniel Tut's uh, – sorry, you are Daniel Tut. That's Daniel Tut, Chris Cattrall, wow. and Doug Lane, three people from the tour, all basically hold this line that it, the, the only solution can come from the working class. And the thing is, is if the working class has been so de-skilled and rendered fungible, if most of what it does as productive labor is not actually productive of anything outside of profit and waste, um, what, what, why, why, why? When when Marx was writing, there was there were working class 
alternative institutions to the mainstream bourgeois society. There was an actual working class movement. There was actually something to harness and guide or direct. There isn't such a thing right now. And the idea that we need to you know, do CPR on the working class, it seems, uh, what's the word? Um, anachronistic when I, we are in a neo-feudal society. And th the thing about neo-feudalism is that it is post-class. It's a caste society, and so this is this is this is the problem as we see it. And I don't think the solution is to say go back to getting people to see themselves as the working class, getting people to see themselves as human, and getting them to realize that what we consider productive is actually anti-human, is more important. And the thing is, is I think that that it gives us a basis from which to work that is a lot better. For let, me, work let me ask you. Let me ask you. Let me. Let me, let me I, my God, I've, I've got to. I've, Sorry, go ahead. Everything go ahead. I'm saying. Everything I'm saying is a syllogism. It concludes in what I'm about to say. So you can't yeah. half follow what I'm saying up until this point, right? I Without, am. Okay. So, what was I saying? Okay. <laughs> sorry, that was my fault. I, it, I think it I'm concludes. <laughs> I, I'm holding this thread. You know. God damn it, Daniel. You're doing. You. Uh, you got it. You got it. You got it. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I think that this is a more pro-human position that is less susceptible for falling into identity politics, whether it be on the basis of marginalization or on the basis of worker, uh, be, being a worker, which working class identity politics sucks. And uh, th that is what burn, that's, that is the end of Bernieism, right? Like the end of Bernieism is for people to see themselves as workers, assert that they are workers, and, and what? So that they could get some more representation, maybe a little bit higher wages, maybe some Medicare. But the point is, is that the system itself, insofar as we are workers in it, and we're actually destroying the planet. We're actually destroying ourselves. Our identities as workers are really like the the empirical results of our own uh, destitution, right? Like there's nothing noble about this kind of production. The system itself has to be dismantled. In some way, and there has to be some kind of an alternative to it. Seizing it doesn't get us out of that situation, and that's the part one of the barriers the old left ran into. Yeah. My main question to you is: How will the reign of of capitalist necessary domination over the working class, which let's put to the side this notion of the feudal thesis, because that whole structure of the neo feudal thesis is basically an argument around the collapse of social mobility. So it's basically, right, yeah, right. We, it's, it's basically, yeah, we accept the Marxist proposal of a great schism between two classes, but now it's gotten so onerous, but why? Well, part of the reason that it's gotten so onerous is because we have no uh, form of politics that contests power vis-a-vis -vis standing for working class interests. Because again, Gortz is arguing that from the standpoint of collective interests, I mean, so first of all, whether you accept the neo-feudal thesis or the classical Marxist thesis on class, you must confess or admit at least that we have emerged within capitalist society, a class who must sell their labor as a wage as a commodity which is at the nexus of the generation of a surplus value, which now in this post May 68 arrangement is no longer, according to these philosophers, uh, that process. Uh, well, the power of that collective agency uh, is neither here nor there for determining collective human freedom. So you've abandoned yourself. By saying that, you've abandoned yourself and you've abandoned um, the prospect of thinking about politics through identifications with that class of dispossessed people for whom you were born into, for whom you still are a part of. So why would you do that? And when you do that, then you are going to think about freedom and appeals to freedom with the PMC problem. Because I feel that, Dave, the PMC problem now is staring you back in your face. Because what you've articulated is basically congruent with what the PMC also thinks about freedom. They're also for 
uh, Which is this, what? Liber this libertarian uh, austerity thing of punishing individuals for climate change, punishing individuals for their speech, da 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 da. I don't hold. Well, you, you still I have a bureaucratic class which is going to formulate a theory of social freedom that will be disciplinary. How do you get rid of that? The only way to get rid of that is through the organization, both culturally, ideologically, politically, of a working class interest from that cohort of people I just mentioned before that can advocate for their interests. It's not going to reproduce fascism. It is not boring. It is not antiquated. It is, I think, the ABCs of politics. We just haven't lived it in our life. And when we tried it with Sanders' campaign, we were put in our place. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try it again and again and again, like the whole Beckett, fail again, fail better. So that's my view, because you can take and supplant your whole philosophy, and it will realize itself better if you orientate it around a collective working class interest, in my opinion. If you don't, you will become sway to the very thing that you despise which is basically what we have today. That's my, that's what I would say. So the working class is not the proletariat. The proletariat is something very specific. Saying that the proletariat is not the revolutionary subject does not mean that the working class is not the revolutionary subject. The working class can be understood as being constituted by this contradiction that is on the one side people who can, to some degree, get pride from their work and feel ownership of their work, but feel like they're not getting uh, enough control and ownership, and therefore they can, you know, they want it that, as opposed to those who can't identify with it, cannot uh, see a, a, a future worth living wherein they continue to do that kind of work. Uh, and now, now, this working class in itself, the issue is how it becomes for itself. Now, I don't know how Gore's. Uh, would take this, but I'm just saying, as far as like where we stand, I think after um, going over this yesterday, and we do have to go over it again now in light of our conversation with you. But the position with neo feudalism, you say, you know, whether you accept the thesis or not, well, th there's a way that you define it that is a problem. For and I think it's uh, it's not a problem for you, maybe it's a problem for me though, and that is that. I don't think it has to be a two class theory. And in fact, the whole PMC thesis is that now, if we, if we hold that this is a class, well, then it's a three class theory in neo feudalism that has a PMC, that's a three class theory. But if we then say, well, it's not a class, it is a subsection of the working class that has a crucial role in the reproduction of the class division by maintaining that there are those who are responsible for following and taking orders or essentially following the right influencers or leaders, uh, subscribing to the right ideas versus those who are supposed to be the thinking this, leaders, influencers, representatives, whatever. Um, the issue with post-Taylorized, post-industrial society is that whatever that grouping is, has removed any kind of real power from the working class. And now it actually doesn't have that power itself. It's essentially fucked. And so uh, the you know, working class uh, based uh, to PMC uh, intellectuals who see the solution coming from the working from the the broad working class, I I have a lot of appreciation for. Uh, I have a lot of appreciation for. Instead of being like technocratic assholes who are like, "No, we've got the solutions. We don't need you." Uh, but on the other side, though, it's like this idea that the workers know best, mm -hmm. or that we could even figure out which workers' opinions fucking matter. Like, I well, that that actually comes from that actually comes from certain strains in part of Maoism, which argued that this and as well as even Lukacian Marxism, which we got to be careful when we incorporate it, because if you incorporate this notion, and what I mean specifically is the social epistemology, which would argue that there's a different form of knowledge that is produced by virtue of one's exploitation. 
by virtue of the experience of oppression, that that knowledge is knowledge for politics, right? Now, you can take that in a different way. From standpoint, you, epistemology thing, right? You can, sure, exactly. You can take that in a liberal way, which would have a kind of overly ontologized conception that almost falls into a strange, I don't know, quasi-social Darwinist late 19th century form of racism unbeknownst to itself in which, well, if we think power beyond product, the sphere of production, okay, well, then you can quite easily see how these young post-colonial, decolonial grad students at the Ivy Leagues today will cancel people like they canceled my friend for teaching Sigmund Freud because Sigmund Freud is a white European patriarch, patriarchal figure, right? The gallons had to this kind of shit happen too, yeah. Okay. So you <laughs> see, you see, but wait a second, wait a second. Gortz was advocating for, oh, you see, politics is about ideology, ideology as well. Like there is an outside to ideology against Zizek, in my view, in the sense that politics is about politicizing domains of social life. Okay. That's that's a choice. That that's that's a form of organization and education. That's that's the enlightenment. Like Marx had this debate with Willem Waitling, this working class socialist who argued that the working class needs no education. He was like a vulgar standpoint epistemologist. This is before 18. Right, 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 right. You know this, you know this story? You know this story? No, no, no. But I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing that this is like one of the noxious tendencies of workerism. So, well, that, yeah, well, because you see, um, Blanquiism had the view uh, since French Revolution, the far left expression of Jacobinism had the view that the knowledge of exploitation does not require any discursive elaboration. Marx was opposed to that. Right. That's why people say Marx was on the side of enlightenment, because he said, actually, no, workers still do need education. And right. that actually goes to the heart of your project, which I think we yep. talked about at the pizza place in D.C., which is, uh, well, um, in fact, not everybody is going to immediately have a love of time energy, an awareness of time energy, a love of otium that needs to be cultivated. Right. You need institutions that cultivate it adequately and well. There's different forms that that can take, right? The current form is actually like almost like post bourgeois in its curriculum. It's like, which is very scary, very scary. Terrifying. You know what I mean? Like um, all the classics are full of patriarchal white men. Don't read them. Right. right? Or this crazy guy on Twitter. By the way, by the way, Finkelstein is great on in his, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. Um, that, and I saw you tweeting about him recently. And so I just yeah. wanted to say, Sure. He spends a huge section on why the canon is actually amazing. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of revolutionary kernels in there, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Yeah. So so ed education matters. Um, we don't have to be workerist to advocate. I mean, Alain Badiou has this idea that the proletariat, from a philosophical point of view, is always thought of as an ensemble. Hmm? It's kind of a nice uh, concept, which is um, Marx said this, that the proletariat is found in the ensemble of social relations of exclusion, uh, uh, not exclusion. Uh, uh, what is the ensemble? Exploitation. So what is this ensemble? An like, ensemble, I mean, I mean, I an ensemble music, it solves, I think. We can dignify Gortz if we think about it more like this, where Gortz was so opposed to even touching the sphere of productive labor. Why was he opposed to that? Well, he saw what happened with Stalinism. French Stalinism was terrible. Um, Foucault once said, you can understand most of my theories of power as an imminent commentary on French Stalinist milieus. He actually said that, which is really interesting. Yes. Which is really interesting. I figured it, I figured it was more like his his beef with malice. I didn't realize that he said it's about the Stalinists. That's really yeah, because cool. that they were the dominant intellectual okay. uh, institutional force in the French left, right? Okay. So uh, therefore, they these May sixty eight philosophers create this idea of freedom, and they say, well, we can set we can say farewell to the proletariat. I I mean, 
we can have that conception of the Gortzian realm of freedom by thinking about the construction of a proletariat vis-a-vis -vis the non-subject, as well as making a fight within the PMC, which we would have to do no matter what. Why? Because the PMC are the vanguard, the beginning point of any engagement with institutions. Therefore, right. to discard them would be like to discard reality itself. You'd be just running up against a brick wall. No, you need to contest and repoliticize the PMC. Politics, repoliticizing right. social reality. That goes back to my point at the pizza place. Like this is this is why we called the class on the PMC at Theory Underground, which was the second course yeah. uh, at in the catalog, um, professional managerial class consciousness and ideology. It's not. It's the consciousness is actually important it's it's on the side of your rank and file worker it's important to have that consciousness because you're going to be told by your representatives oh i'm just like you you know i also am a worker and uh, abolish the the role the radical responsible role of the mm. person who is in that position so mm. they want to add you know they want to disavow their role in the reproduction mm -hmm. and then on the other side for actual pmc people to learn how to be of but not for, but instead, yeah, you can be of the PMC. You just have to be for the working class. Now, I, I have to say, I'm actually trying to get a job at a university right now. Th this is not a contradiction. This is not a hypocrisy. This fits into everything I've ever done and thought about. Sure. So it's not a, uh, so yeah, I a hundred percent agree with you. And this is, I, although I, I there are, there are limits. I just wanted to, there I just are limits to though. All, there, 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 there are, are huge limits. There's, there yeah, there's, 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 there's big limits. To, you know, you can get yeah. people that, parade in in this kind of liberal Gramscian way where again the through line is your commitment to an understanding of how class power operates and to solidarity going back to some basic I think basic tenets about ultimately like Marx's capital and like what are we dealing with here like what are the primary matrices of social conflict like how do we understand these things you know it, it, it kind of goes back to some basic bare bones questions and um and keep in mind also that we live in a time of such immense social upheaval and even i would say gortz did as well anytime after the second world war has been marked by that such that you have generations of left-wing thinkers right that put forward very uh innovative conceptions of revolutionary praxis which end up getting eaten alive by their reigning ideology a great example the most popular communist text probably in our lifetime is Hardin negri's empire series name one idea from there that still has legs today probably it's very hard to do part of the problem is is that the foundation of their their the foundation of their orientation was may 68 thought it was Foucault and Deleuze, usurping Marx. Now, you may say to me, well, we, what makes you think you're such a genius going back to Marx? That's kind of boring. Well, it may be theoretically boring, it but... Not, I would never. I would never. Don't put the... The boring word okay. is not one I would have ever used. For When okay. I say anachronistic, but, I'm not saying boring. Yeah, there you go. Anachron anachronistic. There you go. Anachronistic, yeah. Whatever, whatever. But eh, maybe Marx is... A practical political thinker at the end of the day that's more and more my thinking about marx i'm less inclined to think of marx as some wizard of the value form who like perfectly proves the inadequate i mean yeah but like i don't need somebody to perfectly prove the failures of capitalism because i've lived like we all like that goes back to the class thing it's like okay I, i'm I, that's obvious like next that's actually kind of a petty bourgeois thing. It's like, oh, we must prove this. To who? Well, ultimately, then you get these Marxists, like like these post-Frankfurt school thinkers that are like, oh, well, Marx teaches that even the aristocrats are alienated and uh, everybody's alienated. And uh, I, that doesn't work for me. Like, it's just the same problem and another flip side of the Foucault thing of everything is power. You know what I mean? You just lose so much when you get that, you, that, that it becomes quasi-religious. 
I, I, our, our only way that we uphold Marx here is to say that we have to do what he did, um, which is very different from saying uh, copy and paste his ideas onto our moment. And so like what I take to be the thing that he did is taking all of the uh, bourgeois insights, the knowledge, the, 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 the theory uh, that gives uh, you uh, uh, an outlook on the current situation that is going over the head of your rank and file activist, and then sublate those into a new theory. But the thing is, is like you, that you have to understand the situation you're in. And bourgeois intellectuals are usually pretty good at diagnosing things. They're not good at solutions. And so this is what you know. This is like, like that dialectical process. Of you got, you've yeah. got to take, you've got to take post-Marxist, and you've also got to take non-Marxist people like McLuhan. Like Doug Lane in Portland said that McLuhan and uh, I forget the other guy who he mentioned that he called them. Oh, Heidegger. He said they're bourgeois thinkers. And it's like, yeah, they are bourgeois thinkers. A lot of great thinkers are bourgeois thinkers. In fact, a lot of great ideas are bourgeois. The point is, is to take that back into, sublate it back into something that gives us a new edge on the current situation. And I the, the, point with, the point with McLuhan, and this is how I agree with we both, I know I'm speaking for Nance, but we, we just talked about this last week. The critique of Hart and Negri, um, and I have, there's two parts of this. One is a story about Zizek and, and when I met him, the first time and then the other is like our actual critique of Hart and Negri so I had the book Empire with me because I was reading it for the first time back in like 2016 and we were at this uh this conference in uh Athens Georgia and um, I had him sign a copy of the sublime object of ideology and then I was like oh could you also give me like a one sentence critique of Hart and Negri's empire and so he he did and he wrote multitude is fascist i disagree actually i mean in part i see that that is, that would go well with that gortz position that you don't like i get that but the position that we have is actually this more baudrillardian one which says that McLuhan thought we were moving towards a global village actually it's the global fractured uh shards of what we're people and that you know that's this whole oh we're consumer identity identities we're not actual people anymore and so this uh this is where you take where Baudrillard takes the medium as the message and he turns that into the mass era or the mass age mm -hmm. is the message, the mass age. But when he says mass, he doesn't mean multitude. He means the exact opposite of multitude, mm -hmm. which is to say it's not a mass of people who can be integrated into something that can mm -hmm. be organized into something. It's inherently a byproduct of mm -hmm. the media, the medium itself, unintegratable. And so, of course, that should be, I think, for us, then, the situation that we have to try to understand and find some way of overcoming. And right. then and then a lot of the Marxist organizations think that the way of overcoming that is to start a newspaper and to go hand that to people and, to, you know, sell copies of it on the street corner or whatever. And it's like, this is from an age of a different medium where there was a mass. We're Absolutely. Post -mass. We're post-multitude. Absolutely. Give me, okay. give me one sec. I have to go to the uh, restroom. I'll be right back. Okay, and then I want Nance, because I, 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 I'm assuming that you can still hear us while you run there, uh, Daniel. So let's each uh, touch on anything else that we need to say before we close out, um, because I know that this was supposed to be an hour and a half. Tut has been gracious, giving us an extra 18 minutes already. So let's um, start to say whatever we want to say and close. I uh, I want to incorporate all of the um, criticism. I really do, but there's just some points that I that I'm not willing to give up ground on. Um, I don't think Gores is positing that any future revolutionary will come from this non-class. I think he's diagnosing the state that we're in as a non-class as a post-class. Now, maybe I read it wrong. Maybe I was projecting onto that because I also take the position that we already are post-class. Um, right. But I, I, I don't think he's doing the thing where he's saying it necessarily will come from them. I think he's just saying, hey, this is what we all are right now. 
Um, similarly to how you're not, saying, you're not you're not saying that we're post class in the sense that there is no working class that has to sell its labor, blah, blah, blah. You are saying it in the possibility, the virtual possibility of it going for itself. Is that right? Yes. OK, just to clarify. OK, go yeah, ahead. I mean, and I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I agree that he's I mean, I basically agree. But I think that. Well, hold on. I feel bad for interjecting go already. Ahead. Because he, go he ahead. Was go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Finish your point. Sorry. No. But you got me thinking. <laughs> now, no. now I I got derailed. Um, and and I do think um. Yeah, if 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 we can uh mitigate necessity or or uh marginalize necessity itself to free us up to our own involvements, um, I think that's a noble cause. Um. And I I I do think that that itself could lead to revolutionary. I think it's a revolutionary sentiment. Um, and again, uh, yeah, I, I, I fully accept all your criticism. I do. But we don't need a new revolutionary subject and we don't need an old revolutionary subject. We need a post-class, post-subject, post-trust society set of values and orientation and general direction and goal that would help us harness and then uh, confine uh, necessary bullshit to the realm of heteronomy and free up cooperative and autonomous spheres of activity because without that, we are fucked. Okay. Right? The, the, the problem and the case I want to make for remaining in fidelity to this broad solidarity of working class agency uh, is tied into the fact that Yes, the experience and the degradation of the broader proletarian condition, which in its ensemble um, is composed of different um, stratum of, of, of working class, of lumpen proletariat, of um, if even, even what Badju and Zizek call um, nomadic proletariat. So, you know, we should also include like displaced people, refugees. In all of that heterogeneity, uh, you will not uh, formulate a politics which is capable of producing a thorough uh, expansion of the realm of freedom unless that politics engages in a contestation over the dominance and the hegemony of capital. A lot of 68 thought, and I'm not accusing Gortz of this, but let's say Deleuze and Guattari, Okay. formulated a politics which ultimately resulted in not being capable of contesting capital and its surplus extraction, which will result, in, will result in a society of a sadomasochistic structure of winners and losers in which there must be a subservient class that is dominated. You, in a Nietzschean sense, Nietzsche loved this. This is most natural for Nietzsche, right? You must uh, persevere and hope that you become a winner, right? The social, uh, the, it's very Freudian too, because it's a horde. Society is basically a horde. So you, you can also have a realm of freedom as horde, which still is dominated by capital, wherein agents fight against each other so that they're not neo slaves that's that to me is what politics must be about uh, yeah. destroying and the the pre we're talking about the preconditions for the realm of freedom the preconditions for the realm of freedom have to have broad working class solidarity across this ensemble uh, otherwise uh we will reproduce that sadomasochistic structure and we already live with the violence that that produces and we know the violence that it produces because we happen to be people born into parts of it which we were already born like lower on the rung and we've had to live with this and so i don't know like i just think that these appeals during the time that gortz wrote came from a milieu of a lot of optimism actually um, and that's why you saw them side with Milton Friedman, 
promote these kind of weird neoliberal things which produced the neo-feudal thing ultimately why because capital was unchecked in their praxis not necessarily their fault but that's how it worked still got to read him still very in, uh, inspiring um but there's a lot of blind spots i i think that that's the point we should probably close on so um i guess my little I, I I would like to come back and, and talk more about this after we've had some time to digest it, to kind of sit on it. We really look forward to hearing. And we got to have uh, we got to have Mikey back on too because I think of the yeah. three of you, he's probably the biggest court set of all of us. Right. Well, it's, he hasn't he hasn't read this book, but I think he'd like it. Um, we 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 need to read more Gores. We need to understand the context he's working in. Uh, I I think he's not responsible for. Um, how the things he's seeing um get uh put into a politics when there is no politics that has ever existed that has posed a real problem to capital and i know i know that's a problem that's a but i just don't think that there's any viable strategies on the table that there hasn't been uh, there's there's been times historically where it made sense that a strategy put forward, say by Marx or Lenin, looked like it actually had a way forward. Um, but we still, if from from the, the the theory underground position is, we don't know. There's probably a way forward. That's why we're not completely black pilled. But we do tarry with these people who are black pilled on the old left. But at the same time, we hold to certain core insights from the old left. And the most important one is the one that you were touching on, which is that we come from uh, we come from a class of people who aren't supposed to read, who aren't supposed to think, who aren't supposed to have lives outside of work. Who now aren't we're at, to... now we're now we're the ones asking the most important questions because we're asking questions that like are the we're asking the right questions. Like we're reading the right, right text, we're asking the right fucking questions. I'm not saying that we're all genius worker intellectuals or anything like that, but I am. I do. Right, think, right, right, right. But I do think, to our credit, what you're doing is. Why do you think people got so mad about my tweet, which was just, I'm excited to have an essay in this book. That's all that I said. Do you think it has uh, anything, the, the it have anything to do? Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that most avenues of intellectual inquiry can make no uh, claim on their own subversive potential? Which I think actually, <laughs> what you guys are doing, you can make that claim. Like you are making that claim, as I see it. So that's a credit to you. Um, which again, is not like, oh, so profound genius, but like, no, you're in the no. arena asking the right questions which most intellectual life is not they're not asking the right questions it's like they're so caught up in all of these other layers of problems that it's harder for them maybe to see clearly on things that's how i see it at least well and so i just feel like gores is the best kept secret on the internet and that reading him felt like such a breath of fresh air because he sublates genuine insights that the new left was struggling to theorize but he does it in a way that seems to actually have a future and still do honor to and dignify core insights from the old left and so essentially we like that and we would like to be able to have a more sustained dialogue about it we were talking about this yesterday we want to bring you back and read it cover to cover we'll take turns reading and promise not to do any exegesis of our own you get to comment after each paragraph and it might take us 30 hours, but we just oh. want to invite you to do it. We, we're down. You might have you to guys, take a vacation. You guys are gorgeous heads. <laughs> you are serious. You got to get one of those little bobble things in the car where it's like his head. And he just goes. He looks too crazy, man. I don't like the way he looks. It really freaks me out. I think that it's <laughs> the main reason. It is the main reason that uh, he no one ever read him was because he looked crazy. But um, what it, okay, so we're, we're closing out right now. Michael Downs, you joined at the worst time possible. Uh, Nance, uh, maybe yeah, we're just saying our closing statements right now. We'll have to come back and do this with with Mikey some other time. But uh, yeah, any closing thoughts there? 
I, I just, I, Daniel, thank you so much. Um, I, when Dave and I were talking about this, um, I, I do believe you are one of the most genuine um, people on the internet. And I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your, your input. Um, and I am looking forward to being able to tell you why I think you're wrong about some of the things I think you're wrong about. Uh, but no, we really do. Re we really do appreciate it. And my respect for you tripled uh, after our uh, event in DC. And because uh, I think that there's something that comes through in the flesh in the meat space that doesn't come through right. over YouTube and just seeing you do stuff. It's like, OK, whatever, man, I don't care. But then meeting you, I'm like, oh, I do give a fuck. This is very important, and especially after reading your Nietzsche book, because, you know, you were a figure on the Internet left. And to me, I think that there, you, people say this kind of stuff. Oh, Tut's trying to make everybody happy. And then I, re reading you, I realized, no, this is like really serious. You're really tarrying with a real problem here. Mm -hmm. And and then I think that the the thing I admire the most is that you are trying to be in dialogue with the people who are seriously thinking about the problems right now. And yeah. that even if you think that you have the solutions, you're well, or, or at least some of the solutions, you're you're willing to uh, engage with people who are skeptical of that. And uh, so that, seriously, we really appreciate it. That's awesome, guys. Thanks. I already gave you accolades and props, so I'm not going to do it again. We Don't do it again. Our, we, do like, it. Uh, there's this professor who, uh, he, he, it's a beautiful like statement. I think about like um, maybe authority at the end of the day, but he. He's the kind of guy, I think, like, he only gives compliments, like, once. But the rest of his compliments that he gives, and that one compliment is very small. But it itself, because he's a very accomplished professor that I really respect. So having a compliment from him was such a gratifying thing. But then, you know, the rest of his compliments were, like, tearing me, tearing my ego down. That, yeah. is, master that, is, that is a masterful way to treat somebody that you respect like keep keep the praise very low and work on yeah so um but well, my praise was that my praise was that your heart's in the right place i didn't sure. say that you're serious <laughs> oh yeah. ha 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 well, yeah. well time will tell time will, time will tell, tell gentlemen time will tell it's been all right well thank guys. you so much yep. yeah thank you all right. so much all, all right. the best take, thank take, you. take care daniel all right, I'm gonna all right. Stop. Recording, recording stop